Hi, I am Dr. Lottie Valentine, and I've been invited to share my two near-death experiences that occurred in 1992 and 1994. So the first one happened after my third child was born, and this child was born between a 7.4 and a 7.2 earthquake. And during that 7.4 earthquake, I my life flashed before my eyes, and I really thought that that was the moment I was going to die. Everything in the unit, in the hospital uh, labor ward was shaking. All the tools on the steel trays were shaking and they were levitating up and down. And my labor actually stopped. And after about 30 minutes, the earthquake started to calm down. I gave birth and then we had a 7.2 earthquake. And as soon as they gave me the baby to hold, I started leaning backwards and just screaming for my husband to take the baby, take the baby. I was in so much pain. And there was a lot of blood clots that came out. And the midwives and the nurses were massaging my abdomen to try and get all these clots to come out. And I was put on an IV on Pitocin drip to contract the uterus back down. And they kept me in the hospital for an extra day to make sure that the bleeding had calmed down and everything looked good and sent me on my way. Well, 10 days later, I hemorrhaged a really large blood clot. It was the size of a, of a man's large fist. And we went to the ER. My husband came home from work and took me to the ER. And my parents were visiting from uh, Europe because I was born and raised in Europe. And they were taking care of my two boys that were six and three and a half and the newborn baby. And so we go to the ER and they do a manual examination and they told me, nothing much was going on right now. And there was no lab work done. There was no ultrasounds, just a manual inspection. And they sent me on my way. And the next evening, the same thing happened again. And I hemorrhaged one more time. And it was pretty late at night. So I had my husband call the hospital and ask what we should do. And it was decided that I should see the doctor the next morning. And I saw the doctor the next morning and again, a manual inspection, no lab work, no ultrasound, nothing. And they sent me on my way. Well, that evening, Friday evening, I hemorrhage again. So we go back to the ER and again, they do a manual inspection and they say, well, not much is coming out right now. It could have been another lining. And they kept me for observation and they just closed the door to the ER. I had no bell to ring, no way to call for help. I was just lying there by myself in the ER. And eventually I started bleeding again. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm finally bleeding in the right time. I'm in the ER and I'm bleeding. Now they're going to figure out something is wrong with me. So I'm just lying there and I'm not thinking much of it because I have been bleeding. This is the third day I'm bleeding. And eventually a nurse comes in to just check on me and she opens that door and she just, her jaw just drops to the floor and she's like, oh, just horrified at the sight of me lying on this table with all this blood around me. And so I hear the call on the loudspeaker, OBGYN, stat to the ER, OBGYN, stat to the ER. And all I'm thinking is, well, this is good because... Finally, they're going to figure out something is actually wrong with me. So a middle-aged physician comes running in full speed to the ER with a younger physician in tow. And again, they examine me. And as they examine me, I hemorrhage again. And at this point, it was the fifth time I was hemorrhaging in three days. So I try to sit up to tell the doctor that I am not feeling too good. And... This doctor obviously had been around the block a couple of times, so he knew what was happening to me. And so he just pushed me back down onto the table and they started tipping the table backwards and my head was going towards the floor and my feet were going up towards the ceiling. The whole room filled with hospital staff and my eyes are at this point are just closed. And I have a nurse on my left trying to place an IV, but my veins are collapsing because I'm now you know, going into shock. So she's trying to get the IV into my arm and the nurse on my right is quoting my blood pressure. As this is going on, the nurse on my right is quoting my blood pressure. And she says, she yells out, 50 over 15, hurry. And the nurse, and I'm thinking, what's taking her so long? Why can't she get that IV in? 
And it's shortly after that, that I realize that I'm dying. So I am completely aware that I am dying, which is very different from when I was giving birth and in that earthquake, when I had life flash before my eyes and thinking, oh my gosh, this is it, I'm going to die. This was a knowing. I knew that I was dying. And it was shortly after this moment that I was felt like I was starting to get pulled out of my body. And I was a complete atheist at the time. I was very scientific and my wor worldview was very materialistic. I had no beliefs in the afterlife. I had no beliefs in angels, in soul survival, nothing. And so here I am on the table and I'm pleading with God, just please let me live. I have three children under the age of six. They need a mother. And it was shortly after that, that I got pulled out of my body. And I just find myself hovering about three or four feet above my body. And as I'm outside my body, my first thought is, how can I be outside my body and still be me? How does this work? Because I had no belief in soul survival or that you, that could even happen. But I, there's also a knowing that I belong to that body down there, just like you know you live in, in your house or your apartment, or you know which car is yours that belongs to you. You step inside. I had just stepped outside my body. But there was also a knowing that there was no time in this state, that I had access to past, present, and future all at the same time because time wasn't relevant in this state. Time was just something that I experienced on the earth plane. And there's also this peace and unconditional love, just very peaceful. There wasn't a panic at all. The panic was right before I left my body. But once I was outside, it was just, I was just in amazement. How can I, how can I be me and be outside my body? So now I find myself tumbling through darkness. There was no tunnel. People talk about the tunnel. For me, it was just sort of tumbling through outer space. That's what it felt like. But then I arrived to what I call the mid station because it was as if you go into an L of a skyscraper and there are a hundred floors, but you push the button for the 50th floor and you get off at floor 50. And you know there are levels below you in the skyscraper and you know that there are levels above you. So that was the feeling where I arrived to this place that there were levels above me and levels below me. But when I get to this place without my body, I'm just in spirit form. I hear the most beautiful music you can ever imagine. More beautiful than any music that you can make on the earth plane. And I turn my spirit towards the right and I see a log cabin very small log cabin, almost the size of a sauna. And I open the door and I look inside, but it's empty. So then I turn towards the left and I see the exact same image that I saw on the right, another log cabin, just a mirror image of it. And I open the door and I look inside, but it's empty. So I'm wondering where this beautiful music is coming from. And as I'm standing there between these two log cabins, I become aware of this growing white light, almost like a fog of bright light is rolling in behind you. And as I turn my spirit body around, I become completely enveloped in this beautiful, magnificent white light that is just extending out into infinity. But this pure white light is a knowing that I am with divine source or God or whatever you want to call that. But that is what we come from. That light is just pure, unconditional love. And that light, we carry that light inside of us. We are part of this light. And we return to this light when we go to the other side, when we leave the physical world. But in this bright, magnificent white light, there is an outline of angels and the music is coming from the angels. And it's almost like an angelic choir is the closest description I have of this. And I'm thinking as I'm staring at these, I, you know, knowing that I'm with divine source, knowing that the music is coming from these angels, 
Why am I seeing angels? I don't believe in angels. Why do I think I'm with divine source or God? I don't believe in God. So it's fascinating that I had this experience, but it wasn't my belief system. But then I become aware of two spirit guides. And the one on the right is telepathically communicating with the one diagonally to the left in front of me. And he says, what is she doing here? She can't be here. She has to go back. And I say, no, no, no. Wait a second. How can I still be me and be outside of my body? How does this work? And the spirit guide on my left says, if I told you, you wouldn't remember, but you will remember this. And then it is like images to sort of appear. And it is as if I'm standing on the moon and I'm looking down onto the earth from outer space. But around the earth, there is a lot, what I called a silvery, glittery fishnet because I grew up in Northern Europe and I rode that little boat for my grandmother as she laid fishnets in the ocean to catch fish for the family to eat. And when she lifted those nets out of the ocean in the early morning sun, the water droplets would sort of shimmer and glitter in the sunlight. And so to me, this is 1994, we did not have Google and the internet then, and we didn't had, had never seen an image of the grid around the earth. So to me, that looked like a silvery, glittery fishnet. And the spirit guide said, everything on earth is connected to each other, but everything on earth is connected up to this grid. And with that information, I got sent back to earth. But that information has stayed with me and that clairvoyance and clairaudience and clairsentience just kept developing more and more and more after these experiences. And after 12 years of having all these uh, clairvoyant and clairaudience experiences, I got a message from the spirit world and I knew that the spirit world had dropped in on me and I had decided that I should go back to work. It had been 12 years. My kids were teenagers now. And I was looking for a degree online. And I found a medical school for naturopathic medicine that combines herbal medicine and Chinese medicine with pharmaceutical and Western medicine. And I realized it was a medical school. And I said, there is no way I can't go to medical school. I'm in my 40s. I can't do this. And I closed the computer. I started walking towards the kitchen. And the spirit world dropped in on me and said, you have to become a doctor. Uh, you are to combine East and West. You are to bring messages and healing to the people. And I was enrolled in my prereq classes literally within a week or two. And I went to medical school after completing all of that. And I had to start from the beginning with high school biology because I was a computer science and business major as an undergraduate. And went to medical school when I was 54 and graduated in 2016. But these experiences that to trust those messages happened because for 12 years, I kept getting uh, information about people being sick in the family or people were going to pass away. Relatives would stop in and say they had passed on. And then I didn't, I wasn't even aware. And uh, one example would be my, my uncle passed away. And that was between my first and my second near death experience. And he came to say that he had passed on to the other side. And I expected my mother to call me from Sweden, where I grew up in Northern Europe, to let me know that her brother had passed away, but she didn't call me the next day. And I waited and I figured, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I got the wrong message. Waited the next day, no call from my mom. And then finally on the third day, my mom calls. And she said, I have something sad to share with you. And I said, yes, I know. Your brother passed away, you know, two, two or three days ago. And she said, how did you know? And I said, he was here. And so that whole development began right away after my first near-death experience. And now what has happened since then is I've written one book, and that is to teach people how to uh, develop their own uh, clairvoyant and clairaudient abilities, because we are all clairvoyant. We're all clairaudient. We can all see and hear uh, the spirit world if we just learn how to connect. And... This book is also trying to teach you how to live. So it's it has all my near-death experiences in it, but it also teaches you how to connect with yourself so that you can open up and fulfill your own goals in this life and find a path to 
doing what you incarnated to do in this life. So now I work as a physician, but I also work as a medical intuitive and I work as a uh, psychic medium and to help other people find a path to healing their own life physically, emotionally, and spiritually.